Well, Gail, thank you for that introduction. Hardly needed. I look around the audience and it's all people I've known for many, many years. And I'm standing here wondering what on earth am I going to say to you in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes that you don't already know. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Maybe there are some anecdotes that you may not remember that you might find uh, interesting. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here. Uh, as, as you heard, I spent close to 30 very, very happy years on this campus. And uh, coming back today brings back wonderful memories. Um, so I was instructed that this was a little bit of a storytelling exercise. Uh, so I'm not going to talk at length about continuous casting of steel unless you really want me to. Um, but I thought I would choose as a theme for today two areas that have, I think, been fundamental to my life. One is serendipity and the other one is excellence. And, and I'd like to, to weave the story around serendipity and excellence. Now, we all live life with some level of expectations. But when we look back, we find that, in fact, uh, most of the things that have happened have been unexpected. The best things, in fact, have been unexpected. And it is the unexplained that has changed the course of my life, certainly. And of course, at that time, we don't always realize how significant that was. So 40 years ago, my husband and I were graduate students at the University of California, Davis. And a friend of my dad invited us to lunch. Now, you know, when you, any graduate students in the room? Ah, you know what that's like, right? I don't really want to go to lunch with some old people. I got so many assignments. I'll just stay and do them. But we didn't want to seem ungracious, so we went. And we met this uh, Indian gentleman called Kulbir Singh. Didn't know the man at all, complete stranger. And he realized that we were actually interested in jobs. And um, he sort of said, well, you know, my company may be hiring engineers. Would you be interested in coming for an interview? And he said, I live in Vancouver. Now, we had never heard of Vancouver, let alone British Columbia. And we said, where on earth is that? He said, well, just a few hundred miles north. So we bought a car for $500 and we drove north. Uh, to this place we'd never heard of. And lo and behold, he offered my husband a job. And he would, here we are, 40 odd years later, one lunch, one gesture of a stranger, one risk, and the outcome, I don't have to tell you, for us personally, has been outstanding. So I call these amazing moments serendipity. Now we might think of serendipity as dumb luck. Uh, and sometimes it is dumb luck. But the word serendipity was coined by an Englishman named Horace Walpole, who became enthralled by a Persian fairy tale about three princes from the Isle of Serendip. These three princes were always making remarkable discoveries they were never in search of. And he suggested that this fairy tale had tremendous insights about human genius. And he termed it serendipity, uh, the gift of making fortunate discoveries by accident. Now, serendip, the word from which serendipity comes, is the name for Sri Lanka, the place I was born. And so I have always been so intrigued by the notion of serendipity and its importance. So let me return to my beginnings then. Uh, I grew up in Sri Lanka, small island off the coast of India, colonized first by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British for 500 years. Uh, I was born, now you'll know how old I am, when Nehru was Prime Minister of India around the time of independence, and grew up in what was truly idyllic post-colonial Sri Lanka. The schools were outstanding, the opportunities were limitless, of course, until, you know, the, the Civil War. I always wanted to be an engineer. No idea what engineers did, but you'll see that <laughs> that rarely has been something that has stopped me. I have always pursued something that I have had no idea about. Uh, fortunately, my father in particular 
was uh, very enlightened and he made me believe that if you pursue your passion, great things will happen. And so he encouraged me. Uh, when I was growing up, he was constantly, constantly talking about Nobel laureates, Olympic athletes, Pulitzer Prize winning authors, and we would kind of giggle as children. Here we are in this little island of Sri Lanka and this man's talking about Nobel laureates and Pulitzer Prizes and all of these lofty ideas, but it had a profound influence on me in terms of excellence. And I love the following quotation on excellence. Excellence can be attained if you risk more than others think is safe, care more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical, and expect more than others think is possible. My mother, on the other hand, uh, did not have a university education, but she was a master communicator and excelled in human relationships. And so she taught me the importance of being interested in the other. So between the excellence atmosphere from my father and the human relationships bits from my mother, I armed with those two, I went off to do engineering. Uh, 12 women in my class, that was a bumper year. 12 women, we were called the dirty dozen. Uh, I was the only woman in mechanical engineering. I had uh, obviously no females in my class, but plenty of dates. Uh, and all the guys, uh, I would go late to the class because every time I went and sat next to somebody, I would watch the guys squirm for the entire lecture. And I chose not to sit next to the same guy twice because that would be dangerous. So one had to take a level of risks when you, you know, went into these kinds of careers. Um, so I'll come back then to the business of coming to Canada. So that was my early years. Um, having finished a master's degree in mechanical engineering at uh, University of California, and then having come here, I had no idea what to do. Uh, I really didn't want to work as an engineer. I tried that in Sri Lanka. I was in an oil refinery as a maintenance engineer. Ah, not my cup of tea. So I thought maybe I'll do a PhD. Sounds like an interesting thing. So off I went to the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and in those days, you could literally walk into the, the head's uh, office, you know, forget appointments. Uh, no, none of these people were too busy to chat with a future graduate student. And Phil Hill was a wonderful man. But what he told me about what they were doing in mechanical engineering, with apologies to Martha, was rather boring. And I decided, no, nah, nah, that wasn't for me. I had this hunch somehow that Canada was a metals producing country and Computers were just becoming useful, and somehow if I combine those two, I might have something interesting uh, come out of it. So I walked across the street to metallurgical engineering and sauntered into the office of Ed Tetsunian, who was the head of the department. And I said, well, you know, here I am. I'd like to do a PhD in metallurgical engineering. I don't know, but this is sort of my idea. Would you mind if I interviewed a few professors? And, you know, he just, you know, I was surprised. I mean, now I'm surprised he didn't dismiss me just out of hand, tell me to just get lost. But, you know, he rewarded my audacity by saying, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. We'll pay you for a month, and after a month, you, you need to figure out who your supervisor is and then get that person to pay you. Um, but one of the questions he did ask me, graduate students will be interested in this, he said, are you going to get pregnant during your graduate <laughs> studies? And I rolled my eyes and I said, oh no, not at all. Well, truth be told, I had every intention of getting <laughs> pregnant during my graduate studies. So my son Dinesh was born in the middle of my PhD and Angie came not long afterwards. Anyway, as I was interviewing these professors, I also interviewed the graduate students. They are actually more useful than interviewing the professors. And they told me all the people to avoid, first of all. <laughs> So I took those people off my list, and then they gave me a list of whom I should work with, and on the top of the list was this name, Keith Primacombe. So I said, who is this Keith Primacombe? They said, well, you know, you make an appointment, go see him. So I went to see him, and he looked like a graduate student himself, and I wasn't sure whether this was such a good idea. But anyway, he was studying the continuous casting of steel. 
I know that some of you know what that is. I'm, now I'm going to give you my three minutes of technical spiel. Uh, this was in 1977, 1977. Continuous casting is a process that had been commercialized way mid-60s, right? And uh, so think about it. Today we, can, we make 1.6 billion tons of steel worldwide. And this steel, most of it is processed this way. It's, it's poured as a liquid through a mold which has an open bottom. It solidifies on the side of this copper mold which is vibrating at certain speeds. The semi-cooled section, this liquid in the middle, solid on the outside, is uh, then uh, cooled by sprays. And then it's, it's fully solid and it's cut up into long pieces and rolled for various applications, car bodies, you name it. Keith said to me, would you like to work on continuous casting of steel? And I said, what is that? And he said, well, and he described the process just like this. I said, well, sounds interesting. What do you want me to do? He went to his desk drawer and he pulled out a paper napkin on which he had had a conversation with some guy in a bar who had told him that his theories on continuous casting were completely worthless and that actually this copper mold that Keith had been saying to industry uh, was something that did not distort, that stayed rigid and that the heat was transferred through an air gap. This guy from the steel plant had told him that was complete rubbish because he was convinced that this mold tube distorted during casting. And Keith said, you're a mechanical engineer. Just go figure that out. So I said, yeah, sounds like an interesting idea. Why don't I try doing that? So I went to the library and looked for some papers. There were none. I don't know, I thought this could be good or bad. Uh, bad because it's not worth studying. Uh, good because it's really good. Nobody's discovered it. Uh, so fortunately for me, uh, I decided to pursue that. And it was a fascinating, fascinating PhD because I had to use uh, mainframe computers to, to, co to construct a mathematical model. Uh, uh, and remember those days the mainframe computers were less than the size of our, uh, nowhere close to what we have on our uh, cell phone. The entire mainframe for UBC was four megabytes, for those of you who are in computing. Uh, I'd have to go in the night with my cards. Remember the cards? And feed it into the machine, and the next morning it would come out with all these numbers and rolls of paper. Uh, but it was a time when computers were rapidly becoming extraordinarily useful. And to cut a long story short, we were able to categorically demonstrate that these mold tubes were distorting during casting. Uh, creating uh, enormous uh, possibility of creating defects. Steel is very brittle at high temperature. These defects then remain in the finished product and can cause catastrophic failure, particularly if the steel was ending up in critical applications. Um, and so, a long story short, uh, we were able to therefore then uh, communicate this uh, information uh, widely. One of the things Keith used to always say, well, we published the papers, and we never got any feedback. And he would say, you know, Indira, I've discovered something. Publishing in the open literature is the best way to keep a secret. Nobody reads them. <laughs> and, um, and he was right. I mean, the industry, nobody read this stuff. So we got on the road, and we would give these courses uh, pretty much worldwide uh, to industry. And I just loved being in the steel plants with hot metal and um, steel-toed boots and all the rest of it. No ladies' bathrooms, by the way. That was a big problem. Uh, we didn't have ladies' bathrooms in the department either. Uh, I think we had one on the third floor. And one of the things I learned about the days of no ladies' bathrooms is you just walk into the men's bathroom, and then eventually the men stop going in there. Uh, Deidre Hirschfield was a graduate, other female graduate student who, uh, who taught me this, and so I got around that problem. But it was incredibly rewarding to see one's work uh, have such a profound influence on the industry and then to continue to learn from it. So that was the end of that. Next chapter, I then was very kindly offered a job uh, as a young professor in uh, materials engineering. And the wonderful man called Fred Weinberg was head of the department. And you get these letters, right? You are hereby appointed assistant professor, blah, blah, blah. I read the letter, I had no clue what they're supposed to do. So I went to the head's office and I said, Fred, I mean, this letter is great, but what is an assistant professor supposed to do? 
And he said, oh, Indira, that's simple. One or two miracles a week. Uh, five years, you better get an international reputation. And in 10, you better aim to be the best in the world. That's all. Now get on with the job. <laughs> OK, very clear, right? This was not complicated. Uh, the other thing he also told me was that, oh, by the way, um, universities give out titles, not money. And so, you know, work towards getting the titles. Um, so one, you know, one is profoundly influenced by these kinds of ideas. He also said to me, you know, you've been working with Keith Primakum, that's all great, but you have to have independent research if you're going to get tenure. So I launched into another area called hot rolling of steel, and I won't go into details. It was, again, modeling and trying to understand the properties during the process. And my first three papers, uh, my magnum opus that was going to get me tenure, I was so proud of them. I submitted it, and I waited, waited for a reply from the editorial board, and they were rejected outright. No ifs, buts turned out. So I went back to Fred Weinberg and I said, what am I supposed to do now? And he said, well, take the papers and put it in your desk drawer. Don't look at them for two weeks. And then put yourself in the eyes of the reviewer and figure out a rebuttal and what you're going to do to improve the publications to get them published. Did that. They got published. I got tenure. If not, I wouldn't be standing here, I suppose, today. Uh, so it was a very... When I look back, you know, some of the best advice is profoundly simple. Uh, and, you know, for graduate students and those of your colleagues of mine will probably think of those moments in your own career. So I thought I'd summarize this little part of my life uh, with lessons learned before I go to the next chapter. So what were the, perhaps the most crucial lessons I learned? And I would say the first one is learning to be uncomfortable, but learning to be comfortable when you are outside your comfort zone was my first lesson, being both in engineering uh, as well as uh, a female. Uh, delighted to see two of my female colleagues here from which I learned a lot of this. Rabab was the first woman appointed to applied science and engineering. I was the second, and Martha Salkudian was the third. Uh, we were sort of like the three amigos, uh, and yet it was a, a wonderful time to figure out how to be comfortable outside one's comfort zone. The second uh, lesson I learned was always, always, always challenge your assumptions. Uh, and this was why the, my PhD was such a success, because Keith was prepared to ask the question, what if he was wrong in his original assumption, and asked me then to challenge the assumption that machine builders had made about the continuous casting mold. Third one, as I said, is don't be afraid to explore an area you know nothing about. Uh, I absolutely believe that is uh, uh, an extraordinarily important path to some great discoveries. So now chapter two, detour into university administration. The year was 1997, a very sad year. Keith Bremacomb was 54 years old, and he died uh, suddenly of a heart attack. Uh, this was a terrible blow to me personally, as well as professionally. And I took over the job, his job, of director of the Center for Metallurgical Process Engineering. And I also did a brief stint as acting head of Department of Materials Engineering because Ray Medacroft, my colleague who's sitting here, needed a break, a desperate break, and he was going off on sabbatical. And so I got persuaded to do this job for six months. At the end of it, I concluded I absolutely hated university administration. There was no way in the world I was going anywhere near this ever. <laughs> and then serendipity strikes. The vice president research job has become vacant because my dear friend Bernie uh, here decides he's had enough and he wanted to go off and, and do bigger and better things for the hospital. So uh, two colleagues, dear colleagues and friends, Martha Salkudian and Ray Medacraft came to me and said, look, we're nominating you for vice president research. And I said, you guys are out of your minds. I have no administrative experience. I've never been a department head. Why would this new president, Martha Piper, be even remotely interested in someone like me? They said, oh, no, we're going to put your name up. So I laughed. I thought, oh, that's a joke. Nobody's going to bother with that. Well, lo and behold, I was one of the four shortlisted candidates. And I gather 
Martha wanted someone else. I never found out who this someone else was. Uh, apparently, that person crashed and burned in the interview. And so, next thing I know, I'm vice president of research. So I go and look at their office budget, and Bernie, you'll remember this well. The office budget. There was money to pay the vice president. There was money for a, a, a secretary and a little other budget dust, I call it, right? There was no capacity to actually do anything in that job. So I went to Martha, and I said, Martha, before I sign on to the job, you have to double my budget. She looked at me in horror. She said, Indira, that's impossible. I mean, what am I going to do with all these other vice presidents? I said, I don't know. Uh, you either double, you double my budget and I come on, or you keep your budget and you find someone else. I said, when I interviewed, I believed I could help other researchers, but I can't do it on the budget that you have. So, you know, she, um, she kind of grit her teeth, I suppose, and doubled the budget, uh, which was absolutely essential. The other uh, wonderful thing uh, about that time, so my first day on the job, you can imagine, I go from professor to vice president, right? I mean, you can imagine just kind of the confusion and the sheer terror at the prospect of going into the old administration building. And my first day, I come into the office, and there's an envelope, and it says president's office. I'm going, Ooh, how exciting. I wonder what's in here. And I open this, and there's a wand. A Harry Potter wand. <laughs> with a little note. Dear Indira, welcome. Make magic. Warm regards, Martha. <laughs> you know, I think about that. You know, that is straight out of anything you'd expect. Uh, anywhere you might go to a new job. But it had a profound influence. I mean, we all, I carried my wand after that everywhere. I was terrified if I didn't have the wand, and she asked me where it was. <laughs> and she carried her wand everywhere. But sorry to say, the guys on the team kept forgetting their wands, because they had wands too. And so this was a way of light-hearted, if you will, um, team building. She was relentless, as we all know. She wanted me to double the research budget. Uh, and I was fortunate because the CFI funding was going through the roof. Uh, all three granting councils were going through the roof. And so the opportunity was ripe, but I needed a team. There was no way I could do this by myself. So I started talking to people. And the first person I spent a lot of time with was Michael Smith. And I said to Michael, so Michael, why do you think you were able to win the Nobel Prize? What was the secret? And he said, Indira, it's very simple. The university gave me space. The MRC gave me money with no strings attached. And they got out of my way. And I was allowed to pursue completely intellectually driven research. Never forget that. And then he told me the story that some of you might remember uh, about how he nearly left UBC to go to uh, Cambridge because Fred Sanger, who had just won the Nobel Prize, wanted to hire Michael. And Bob Miller, who was vice president research, uh, had decided this was not a good thing. This was 1987, I think. And Bob had gone to see Stan Hagen, who was the minister of advanced education, and said to Stan, well, you know, we have this guy who is very good. He might win the Nobel Prize. He might not. He wants to go to Cambridge. He's being recruited by Cambridge, and we really need to keep him. And this was the 80s for those of you, many of you in the room. There was no money, right? No money, no money, no money. And Stan said, well, what does this guy want? And uh, Bob said, a building. Well, how much does that cost? 15 million. He said, okay, let me see what I can do. That $15 million building the Michael Smith building, kept Michael at UBC. We won a Nobel Prize. UBC's international reputation was seriously heightened, and I learned an important lesson in that conversation with Michael. Gail, you were asking for tips. You know, job as VP research is how do you, how do you take those incredibly risky steps to support uh, 
the researchers who you think have a chance of a, of a moonshot, but also provide the foundation for all the younger people who might someday be a Michael Smith. And for me, that really set the stage for being VP research. Many of you will remember we appointed coordinators. The CFI process was, was exciting. We got researchers together. We told them to dream big. We said, where do you want to be in 20 years? Don't tell me about five years from now because the Canada Foundation for Innovation is not the Canada Foundation for Renovation. Uh, and so anything about renovating your labs ain't going to work. Talk about where you want to be 20 years from now. And we had a $50 million fund from Stuart Blossom to provide matching funding. And as a result of many people, some of you in the room, I remember Rabab's proposal in particular, very exciting proposal that, uh, that you know, combined Faculty of Arts and Engineering. Uh, UBC uh, got the highest amount of CFI dollars of all the universities in Canada. University of Toronto couldn't figure out what it is we were up to. But it was truly the effort of many, many people. Um, so being vice president of research was probably the best job in many ways. Um, I also, you know, the things that we did was about low-hanging fruit. There may not be any low-hanging fruit left. We plucked it all. But <laughs> one of them I remember very clearly. Many of you remember Rick Spratley, a dear man that he was who ran research services forever. But we had a very archaic system, right? You went over to the Office of Research Services to get your grant signed, and then you walked all the way back. And sometimes you went over there and they wouldn't sign it because you hadn't got a copy. So you went all the way back to make the copy. And sometimes you'd go and it hadn't been signed. You walked all the way back. So I calculated if every academic on our campus did that, what the lost productivity was. And it was humongous. <laughs> and so I said, look, we can't have uh, the situation of Moses going to the mountain or mountain going to Moses. I don't know which is the right uh, metaphor. We've got to fix this problem. And so Anne Martin Matthews, I think, was Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts. And we figured out how to get the signatures provided in the Faculty of Arts, as opposed to over in the Office of Research Services. Not a complicated thing, right? But this was the, the kinds of things that I think universities do to completely frustrate their faculty, <laughs> completely and utterly frustrate faculty. And so, you know, my time as vice president of research was exhilarating because there were so many opportunities to remove these obstacles and to create a framework for, uh, for research excellence. Um, so let me move on then and, and say, what did I learn from that experience? Just to leave me a little bit of time to talk about University of Alberta. The, 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 big, the most important lesson I learned was that anything is possible if you have a great team. And I had a wonderful team of people. The, the, the next three are really from Steve Jobs. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that out front in case I'm accused of plagiarism, which would not be a good thing. Uh, he said, foster greatness. My job is not to be easy on people, but to make them better. Second, he said, uh, higher creativity. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes, the ones who see things differently, the ones who will change the world. And that, in a nutshell, I think, is what a great vice president research is all about, uh, is the facilitation, the fostering of greatness, the removal of hindrances, and to be able to be um, open to the misfits, the crazy ones, the wild ideas, the people that are frequently a pest. Right? I remember one time one of our great researchers, who shall remain nameless, for example, walked into my office uh, when I was VP research and said, we need to fire the dean of science. And I said, you've come to the wrong office. The VP, <laughs> the VP academic is down the hall. And this researcher was one of our best researchers, and he was expressing frustration not necessarily about the dean's person, the dean as a person, just about the dean, the, the dean's offices, and how we can bureaucratize our institutions. So, next chapter. While this was going on, my lab was steadily disappearing to nothing. I could not no longer maintain a decent research lab. And the phone does start to ring if you do a half decent job as VP research, and you know, 
people are looking to hire people for presidents. And at that time, I thought long and hard about it. And I had really come to enjoy the business of uh, enhancing, if you will, uh, the capability of others and, and sharing in the joy of, of doing that. Now, I decided I wanted to be a president of, of a large research university with an interestingly diverse student body. I did, not want, I did not think I would fit in a small university. And so I made that decision uh, quite simply. And at that time, University of Alberta and University of Toronto were both looking for presidents. Uh, the timing was slightly off. U of A was first, and three months later was U of T. And if I wanted to apply, or at least wanted to be uh, considered for U of T, pretty ambitious on my part, but anyway, uh, I would have to forego a chance of, of putting my name in for U of A. And I consulted my dear friend, Martha Salkodian. Now, Martha is somebody I phone for everything, right? She has been my lifeline when I've had to make difficult decisions. So I said to Martha, my God, what am I going to do? And she said, you know, Indira, the University of Alberta has great potential. It's a strong university. It's an engineering-oriented university. It's a province with entrepreneurial people. You should seriously take a look at University of Alberta. And she said, my other piece of advice is, I don't think uh, you would really uh, find University of Toronto uh, an easy job. She said, you've never been a dean, true. And she said, the deans will eat you alive. And she was right. For those of you who may not know, deans do eat presidents alive. <laughs> And she was right. A big university with people who've been deans for a long time, uh, a woman from the West uh, with no experience as a dean, clearly was going to be a recipe for disaster. And this is one of the things about going into the next step of one's career, is to be thoughtful about what you absolutely had the capability to do and what you did not. So then I talked to my parents, um, uh, who both sadly passed away. Uh, but. They, as you know from my earlier comments, uh, two amazing, amazing individuals. And my mother said to me, uh, oh dear, don't go to the University of Toronto. She said, it's too big, it's too far away, the children are going to miss you. Children, 24 and 27 or something. Uh, <laughs> and then I said to my father, my dad, what do you think I should do? And he says, uh, University of Alberta. You know, my first, his first name is Albert, by the way. And he said, perfect, I'm Albert, that's University of Alberta. Sounds like there's some, some good rationale. <laughs> Seriously, I am not making this up. Why don't you go to the University of Alberta? And it was the best decision. It was eight, abs 10 absolutely wonderful years. So let me try to recapture, how long do I have? Probably another, I have time? Can I finish? I don't want to, you know, put you to sleep or any of that. <laughs> um, so I, so the University of Alberta, uh, it was exhilarating. I was sad to leave UBC, but it was the right thing to do. I had been here too long. I knew where all the bodies were buried here. Uh, I didn't know where they were buried there. So that was a whole new challenge uh, to go into a different university. Uh, and it was an exciting time for the province. So the first thing we did that I look back with sheer amazement was we had a retreat of uh, all the deans and the vice presidents and associate vice presidents. The uh, University of Alberta has 18 faculties, uh, uh, two campuses, one French and one rural campus in Augustana. So it's a complicated uh, institution, although it's slightly smaller than UBC in terms of faculty and student numbers. So all 18 deans, all the AVPs and so on, we got together for four days in Banff. And what amazed me was at the end of the four days, we had a vision statement. We had the pillars that were going to, to be the foundation of our, of our uh, strategic plan. The vision statement was uh, to inspire the human spirit through outstanding achievements in learning, discovery, and citizenship in a creative community building one of the world's great universities for the public good. I still get goosebumps uh, thinking about that vision statement, about this human spirit. And the four pillars were talented people, learning discovery citizenship, connecting communities, transformative organization and support. And I won't go into all the details. We had, it was a four-page document with a bunch of uh, aspirations, 
everybody knew it, everybody signed on to it, not immediately, we had a, you know, a few town halls and lots of discussion and wordsmithing, but the blueprint came out of those four days or three days of incredible willingness to build something great for the next 10 years. That was the easy part. Then I had to figure out what does a university president actually do? And after much pondering, I, I came up with this, my theory of university presidencies, the three R's, resources, reform, reputation. That's it. If you do those three and you focus on those three, you might actually be able to move the needle a little bit. So first question, how does one get resources? This is the best part of it. Alberta, oil Alberta, <laughs> uh, was making money hand over fist, not from oil, from natural gas. Most of the licensing revenues in Alberta was coming from natural gas. So my job every morning as a university president was to look at the price of natural gas and the price of oil. Because that would tell me whether there was any money over there across the river in the legislature. The first event I went to was the budget uh, for, the, for, for the province of Alberta, province of four million people, a surplus of $10 billion. $10 billion. Well, perfect, right? <laughs> I had a wonderful minister of advanced education, Dave Hancock, uh, a great mayor, Steve Mandel, great team, great chair of board of governors. We put together a case for investment. We got 6% increases in budget for something like five or six years. We were able to attract over $2 billion in uh, building, and the buildings were not, were, were really visionary buildings. And I had nothing to do with the vision for the buildings. These were buildings that were, came together because of deans working together. One was the Edmonton Clinic, where all of the health sciences deans had this, I think, impressive vision to have uh, healthcare teams working together and they needed space where the nurses and the doctors and the pharmacists and the physios and, and the phys eds and all could work together. Uh, and so Edmonton Clinic got built for a billion dollars and CCIS was another building. The science building was also completely interdisciplinary. The Dean of Science came up with the vision with a whole bunch of others and uh, $450 million later we had a, a very impressive science building. So that was the uh, good part was creating the cases. The, and then research funding, we had the Harper government, and I won't go into all the details, but you know, it was reasonably good. Reform, num job number two, not easy. Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton and president of the United States many years ago, obviously, had said this about universities when he encountered the challenges of changing the curriculum at Princeton. He said, universities are like uh, symmetries, cemeteries. You don't know how many friends the dead have until you try to move them. <laughs> and that was true. You try to, to cancel a course, close a program, re-merge faculties, do anything like that, and all you have is uproar. And so it was, it was a challenge to reform, but we did, we did many things. Uh, everything from reform the admissions process uh, to raising, uh, e making it easier for graduate students, uh, better student experiences, all the kinds of things that you'd expect, I think, uh, a great university to do. The, one of the more interesting ones was my third R, which was reputation. The University of Alberta had a strong academic uh, capability. Mel Kamsaros here is an alumnus of the U of A, but it was not well known in Canada. I mean, every time I went to Ontario, they'd say, so how do you like living in Calgary? Even, you know, you'd say, it's not in Calgary, I live in Edmonton. This was how poorly the University of Alberta was known in other parts of the country. And so our challenge was how do we build, not the academic reputation, because that's what the professors do. How do you build the awareness for the university uh, across the country and around the world? Um, and so the, the opportunity arose when we had our centenary, uh, 100th anniversary in 2008. And at that time, I went back and looked at a little bit of the history of the university, and I was blown away. Henry Marshall Torrey, who was the first president, was an absolute genius. He had been hired from McGill. 
Edmonton was a tent city in 1908. And he went there to build U of A with Rutherford, who was the premier. And his ambition was to build a great university on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River. And here's how I know he was serious. His first four professors were hired from Harvard, Berkeley, Columbia, and McGill. Uh, the professor from Harvard recalled years later, after he had been in Alberta for 30, 40 years, he said, you know, when I was approached by Henry Marshall Torrey, he was a man talking about a university that didn't exist, in a place I'd never heard of, in a country I'd never visited, and yet I wanted to go and see him do it. This was the foundation of the University of Alberta. The other part of the University of Alberta was that it was an institution created for the benefit of the whole province. And he made a speech saying knowledge is not for scholars alone, but for the uplifting of the whole people. That was it. Those, that was the phrase that became our brand, or if you want to call it our promise, the uplifting of the whole people. And we used the centenary to really raise the university's profile in Canada and around the world. Some of the things we did, we had the Prime Minister's Conversation Series. We had every living Prime Minister of Canada to come for a moderated discussion about Canada and Canada's place in the world. Um, and many things like this that were just uplifting. Uh, we brought many famous alumni on campus. Uh, I was just always blown away by the quality of our alumni. Uh, Joe Martin, for example, the dean of Harvard Medical School, grew up in Brooks, Alberta. Beverly McLaughlin, the chief justice, grew up in Pincher Creek. Uh, Joe Clark grew up in Foothills. And this was the thing about University of Alberta was the alumni had grown up in all of these small towns uh, in Alberta and had incredible uh, capability, entrepreneurial spirit. And so our job was to get the word out. And I would say to these alumni, the next time you're giving a talk or you're asked anything at all, please mention the University of Alberta as your alma mater. Just do me that one favor. I don't need a check. I just need you to mention the university. Oh, I would like a check too, but, <laughs> but, but you know. And I'm really proud to say that 10 years our reputation, our ability to, to, to make things different uh, certainly uh, was enhanced. By the time uh, I left in 10 years, we had uh, international undergraduate enrollment had gone from 4 to 15 percent. International graduate students were up at 31 percent. Uh, we had uh, incredible buildings. We had a great uh, optimism uh, around what could happen. Great faculty were recruited. Uh, and so on. So it was really a good time. However, before I close, I would be amiss if I didn't tell you about some controversies that I had. Uh, and then we'll uh, open for questions and answers. Because none of these jobs are without controversies. And two of them are particularly worth recounting. The first one was a budget cut. This is now when the oil glow had faded. With no warning, we had a budget cut of 7%. That was $70 million men had to lay off 1,000 people overnight. No warning. Um, the faculty became very restless. This was the day when social media had just become a menace. By the way, when I started as president, there was no Google. There was, well, Google had just launched an IP. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no nothing. By the time I finished, there were blogs and all this other sort of stuff. And there was a blog called Wither the, Wither the U of A by a professor called Jeremy Richards, whom I actually liked very much. And on this blog was all these anonymous postings by various academics who had decided that the budget cut was my fault and there should be a no confidence motion against me in the faculty senate. And so I called Jeremy, highly risky strategy for a president, called him up and said, Jeremy, that's all very nice, all this misinformation. And they were promoting misinformation about what the budget cut was all about. I said, that's very nice, Jeremy. You, you know, all of this is going on. If you pass a no confidence motion against me, in, in the Senate, which was called General Faculties Council, I will be gone in an hour because I have to be gone. And then you will be here for the rest of your career and a mess. Is that what you really want? To his credit, he didn't put that conversation on his blog. He could have. He stopped posting the misinformation and the anonymous postings. Um, it changed our ability to have a conversation on campus that was, and we created a blog called Change at U of A 
to manage that particular difficulty. So that left a deep impression on me, and I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to people who are these days having a leadership uh, position with this kind of stuff. The second controversy was what I call the white, white man controversy. I was interviewed by the Edmonton Journal, and I was asked whether I was at all worried about the fact that now there were more women in the undergraduate program, significantly more women, than there were men. And I said, yes, I am very worried. I said, because if we don't have a good natural gender balance, that's not going to be good for the long term. Besides, I said, um, there are not many people who can dare to be advocates for white men. I can and I will. Whoa, the next day, Edmonton Journal, Indira Samrasekhar, president, uh, supports white men, blah, blah, blah. Posters on campus by many women's groups. She must, be, she must resign. She does not support women. And so I met with the women's groups and I said, I don't know whether you noticed, but uh, of my appearance, my ethnicity, and I said, I'm not supporting white men because I don't support women. I'm supporting white men because if we, women had been supported in the way they needed to be supported, we would not have had this long journey to bring equity. But we don't want to go the other way. And so that was another very interesting lesson. So let me close with a few lessons learned as president. One of the things that worries me today about universities is this atmosphere of political correctness. Um, I think we have lost our ability as an institution to um, ponder those questions in an open and free and unencumbered fashion. We stifle voices that are uncomfortable to us. We are offended by uh, ideas that challenge our comfort levels. And I think universities are losing their uh, prestige and the, the position they've held in society. And so this is something I think urgently has to be taken up. The second thing I, I would say a lesson learned was, um, was around the role of the Senate and the Faculty Association. Now this is, might be controversial in this audience or not. I think the Senates that are the body for academic governance have lost their role uh, as an academic governing body. First of all, they're too large. Uh, we had 167 uh, people on our Senate. It's a town hall. There's no way you can really have decent debate. And so the faculty associations basically have taken over the, some of the discussion points, or at least the, the role of the Senate. And I think that has weakened universities' abilities to have the academics uh, create the vision and advance the ideas that are necessary. And I have spoken on many occasions that we should find a way to reform how our Senates function and to reduce uh, the size of them, or certainly to make them more effective or else we will, uh, we will lose, uh, I think, what has been very precious in universities. Uh, the last one point I want to make is about governments. People always like to uh, condemn governments. I learned one thing as president, you don't condemn governments. They were elected by the people. Like them or not, that's who elected them. And so if you don't like what the government is doing, it's because the publics don't uh, care about the topics that you care about. So your job is to educate the public and then the government will come along. Uh, and we learned this with the, with the Alberta government. There was a first eight years or so we had good reception with the government. The last two years, the governments were very not interested in higher education. And it was because the public was now more interested in healthcare and in these other things. And so one must really be very conscious of one's role as an academic and a public intellectual to be out there speaking to the public about the role of universities and their importance to government. So th those were the three things that I learned. Let me then close with a few words on serendipity because I began with serendipity and I hope there are many things uh, around, my, around my career that you would say uh, were certainly uh, serendipitous. And I would say when I look back at serendipity, for me, the people I met, some of whom in the room who've changed the course of my career with their advice, the ideas that I gleaned from uh, this university, the great people I met, uh, inspired me and have been so vital. And it is that openness to newness, to, to serendipitous ideas that are really uh, absolutely crucial. And let me finally say, if you want to really experience the magic of serendipity, and this is a sort of a, a tourist announcement, 
uh, do visit the island of Serendip called Sri Lanka. <laughs> but you have to take John Bart's advice uh, for, in your plans. And let me quote, you don't reach Serendip by plotting a course for it. You have to set out in good faith for elsewhere and lose your bearings and then you will discover it serendipitously. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>